roll it here. There's angles that we're looking at here. We got different kinds of suspensions. There's three kinds of. What's the three adjustable angles? Somebody tell me what the three adjustable angles are. <coughs> caster, toe in, camber. Yep, caster, camber, and toe. That's what we're looking at right there. <coughs> and they're the same for both types of front suspensions. You see the difference between the short long arm, the short long arm suspension and the McPherson strut suspension. Now, Abby, do you recognize what kind of suspension that red Taurus has got from this picture here? <coughs> the one on the right. That's exactly correct. You're going to have a lower control arm on the McPherson strut. Now, one of the things that makes the McPherson strut suspension better is that you got the weight of the car is being carried higher in the body. You got me? So you've got the strut tower. The strut tower sticks up almost to the hood, doesn't it? But on these other kind of suspensions, look where you're actually carrying the weight. Now, what up something else I talked about the other day is everything, <coughs> everything above the spring is referred to as sprung weight. You ever heard of sprung weight? <coughs> Or sprung. Yeah, sprung and unsprung. <coughs> if it's below the spring, which would be your tire and this control arm and anything that's not riding on the springs, that is unsprung weight because it's sitting right on the ground. You got that? Okay. Now there's two reference points used with the alignment angles. And one is the center line reference, which is nothing more than a line bisected as far lengthwise, and we talked about that in the other day. The other is a zero reference, which is a vertical line, and both the reference points are referred to, you know, during what we're going to be looking at here. Okay, so here you got your camber. That's defined, let me go to the next picture, as the measurement of the inward or outward tilt of the top of the tire from the vertical line. So basically when you're looking at, uh, here's your vertical line, you got a vertical tire, it's a zero camber, it's like that. Now there's your center line right there of the car. So you got a center line of the car, that's one of axis, and then you got your vertical line. And vertical lines, that's your some of your reference points. That one and that one. This is looking at it from the top. That's looking at it from the front. You got that? Center line and zero reference. That's the two, right? All right. Now, when you get on into your camber here, you remember this. Your zero reference line is the <coughs> vertical, and that's what you're in reference to. Your positive camber is going to be when the tire is leaning out, and it's going to make it pull in that direction. We'll talk about that more in a minute. The zero reference being in the middle of that one. The negative is whenever it's leaning in, you see. And this is this is basically being illustrated on your short and long arm suspensions. Got it? Okay. The load is supposed to be projected toward the center of the tire. That's basically uh, what you're seeing right there. See? Okay, if the car has got too much positive camber, the tire is tilted out and in. You got that right there. Most of the time, a car requires wheel alignment because there's too much negative camber. Only, especially on these short long arm suspensions and that causes the load to shift toward the inside edge of the tire and it makes the, wire, the tire wear out on the inside. If you see a tire that's worn out on the inside edge, you're going to see it now. The vehicles like the one that Domain this guys use that drive around out here a lot and they make a lot of turns and going slow. They have a tendency to grind the rubber off the tires just because they're turning a lot going slow. That's going to wear the tires out quicker if it's like a security guard's car and he just drives around, you know, slow a lot in circles, when you're on the road, you're not going to wear it off quite that much because you're, you know, you're, yeah, you're turning, but most of the time you're going straight. But if you look at the front tires, a lot of times on the maintenance truck, you might see them starting to wear before the other ones. That's why it's so important to rotate the tires because of the wear on the front and the rear is going to be slightly different. All right, there's your load projected toward the outside of the tire. What kind of camber is that? Somebody tell me. Positive. Yeah, that's going to be positive camber and all that. Hey. All right, and then here's what right here. The load projected toward the inside of the tire. Negatory. Yep. There's three primary <coughs> reasons for a tire having too much negative camber, okay? One's incorrect trim height, which is riding height or curb height. And the other is, you know, correct. Well, let me show you a picture of incorrect, I mean, of trim height. And you might notice that when you go into that alignment machine out there and you do your alignment, one of the first things they want you to do, they give you actual reference points to measure trim height. They're one of the first steps that thing does. Now, most people don't really measure trim height unless they're really, really getting down and dirty on a really serious uh, alignment. They don't measure trim height a whole lot. But if you see a car that's obviously tilted off to one side or the other, you know, you need to be looking at that. 
And one of the trim height measurements is real easy to make is if you go from, you can measure from right here on the rim to the fender. Not from the ground, but from right here on the rim to the fender of the car because that is a constant. You got me? So right here on the rim to the fender of the car all the way around if you did to tell you how it won't be. Matter of fact, on some of the Fords that have uh, air suspension on them, they're wanting you to do that whenever you got your scan tool hooked up. You tell it what that height is on all four, and it actually corrects from where it is to where it's supposed to be, you know, electronically. With the Okay, now then, there's your, uh, the, there's shims that you're supposed to use to do the short, long, long <coughs> suspension, and, you know, the shim type of alignment was done for years and years and years, but everybody's kind of going away from that now. Most vehicles have got eccentrics and stuff that you use to change your and basically, if you're going to change your, your camera, you're basically going to move this upper control arm in or out. Got me? I mean, there will be eccentrics up here, but some of them had shims and all that. If you, now, there are times if you need to go negative with your camera and you've gone as far as you can, you've done all you can do. You know, you're not always able to set it. Like if, uh, if you were in a situation where there were shims and you needed to take some shims out to give it more negative camera and all the shims were gone, <laughs> you're done. You know, there's nothing, nothing else you can do. You may have to get some frame straightening or something done, or maybe there's springs need to be replaced to make it tougher and all that. All right, see the shims? That's, we're looking down at the upper control arm here. You got me? Uh, McPherson strut suspensions, or which this really doesn't uh, apply to, you know, uh, there's actually... And I'll show you a picture in a minute of the adjusters that do on that. Uh, but the shims on the short long arm, uh, long arm suspension are supposed to uh, uh, compensate the trim height change. Now, what, what do you think happens to your camber if the springs start to get weak? With age, the springs get weak, right? Mm -hmm. You got me? So if with, with the springs getting weak with age, you're basically going to cause, Negative. it's going to squat down and, yeah, the camera the camera's going to go in. And so occasionally you might have wind up having to replace the springs, you know. they got make sure you put the right ones on there. Okay. Uh, so right here, see those adjusters? Now occasionally you'll see one that doesn't have any adjusting capability here, but what you're supposed to do uh, according, even according to the book, is you're supposed to take the shock off and egg shape these holes so that you can actually change that. Now, you might even notice that one there has got a little, got these little washers on there. Uh, the Oldsmobile, if you loosen these bolts up at the bottom of that strut, you can actually, and there's no weight sitting on it, you can move the tire in and out and you can change your camera that way. You might have noticed that. But some, every, occasionally you'll see one that lets have straight holes drilled through there. And they actually, uh, there was one that we did uh, a couple of times <coughs> ago that had to have a, a special bolt kit. Occasionally when you got to do an alignment, you may have to buy a special hardware kit so you can change the angles. And one example of that is on your forge with the uh, I-beam suspension, you may have to get some offset bushings for that they go around the top ball joint for that kind of thing. And we actually, you know, talk about that a little bit later too. So yeah, they got a center support sag. You got the weight on there. And the tendency is for it to go that way anyway. And when those springs start to get weak, you know, it goes to tilting in. Because it squishes the springs too much. And these lower control arms, everybody get this burned in. Lower control arm, upper control arm, there's your spring. As that spring sags, you can kind of see how that's going to change the angle between these. Right? Between the ball joints. The ball joints actually form your steering axis. All right. So some of them, they have an offset bushing you can put in there. And uh, these little bushings right here, sometimes you may, all uh, these with a short long arm suspension, you may bounce the car and hear these things going squeak, 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 squeak. And you'll see the rubber's all coming out of these and all that. And you have to take this upper control arm off and get those bushings out of it. That is an irritating, aggravating job. But it's doable if you have the right attitude going. <laughs> you know, and a lot of the times, I'll tell you, on your, a lot of your vehicles that have an upper control arm now that's, you know, not the stamped steel one, but the other one is like a cast material. You'll get a whole control arm that comes with a ball joint and, a, and the bushings and everything. You just replace the whole shooting match. And sometimes they cost more than like 40, 50 bucks for the whole shooting match. I mean, and it's, it's fairly easy to change those out. Now, we've actually changed the bushings on some. You can get the bushings from companies like Moog and all that. And incidentally, Moog makes really good parts, but you're going to pay through the nose for them. I mean, they're really good. As a matter of fact, the bearing that we put on that... Uh, 
uh, Explorer the other day was a Moog, and it was $300 for that bearing. But now it had a anti lock brake sensor in it and all that kind of stuff. I could have got one for $188, but I didn't like the brand. You know, when you talk about a wheel bearing, you don't, you don't want something that's going to wear out real quick. Okay, there you're going to, uh, whenever you've got your positive camber, like that right there, you got a cone there. Now, if I take a wheel and I lean it to the right and I roll it, which way is it going to go? It's going to go off in that direction. Right. Yep. It's going to roll in a circle toward the base of the cone. you got a cone there. Just keep that, burn that into your head. Positive camber wants to roll whichever way it's, you know, whichever way that cone is is where it's going to roll. Okay, in other words, your car is going to pull toward positive camber. It's going to pull toward the most positive camber. Remember that. If it's, got, if it's pulling, then you know that you've got good tires that aren't, you know, tires can make it pull too. But if you've got all your alignment angles right and the car is still pulling and you know your tire pressure is right, you remember you check your tire pressure first before you do anything else? Yep. Check your tire pressure, uh, get your alignment set up, all your angles are right. If the thing is still pulling, swap the front tire from side to side, see if it pulls the other direction. If it does, it's a tire pull. <coughs> Real simple to do that. Nothing to it. Hey, you know. All right. Okay. Now then, additional camber on left wheel is supposed to counter the road crown. See that? Now, that is an old thing because the highways are flatter now than they used to be. You don't usually see that all that much. Uh, and I will tell you that when you've got one that's set up this way so that it keeps it from you know, falling away from the road crown, if you drive it on the other lane, you know, on a four lane, you're going to feel it falling that way because it's just aligned to, you know. That's the fact that most of the roads were two lanes. They, they were doing them that way. You know, roads are kind of made like this little water one. And so that's just a little, you know. But they're pretty much, they've pretty much gone away from that. Yep. And in Montana, some used to, when I was in Montana in the mid-70s, if it said road construction, they meant what they said. You drove off the pavement and onto the sand, and there was trucks out there and all. They didn't have detours. Wasn't enough roads going to the same place. You had to drive right in there amongst them. Okay, here we go. That's caster right there. You got it? Caster is measured in degrees. It's divided as a forward or rear tilt from the steering axis of the vertical. See that? There's your direction of travel. There's your vertical. See, remember your vertical is actually going to be a uh, reference point for caster as well as camber. I'm confused on caster a lot. Yeah. Caster is something you cannot adjust without a machine. Actually, you can, with that, you can measure caster with that little magnetic thing you click onto the hub, if it'll fit on there. It'll tell you, on the back of it, it tells you how you can just swing it back and forth and measure it. All right. So, there you go. The steering axis is a line that, an imaginary line that is drawn through these two ball joints. And when you change the relationship of the ball joints from each other, now some of your Toyotas will have you adjusting the caster <coughs> with some eccentrics on the lower control arm, and I kind of like that because it's real easy to get to those. Those people were thinking, you walk under that Toyota, you're looking at those eccentrics, you can adjust that caster on that rear, on that lower control arm. Real simple. I mean, they've actually got these egg-shaped eccentrics when you... You know, you turn them. Now, if you turn them both at the same time, you're actually changing the camber. If you turn one and not the other one, you're changing, you're moving this ball joint, you know, or actually this ball joint farther, you know, changing the steering axis <coughs> this way. So, the, this is, if you change the steering axis from front to back, right, that's not going to be your, that's going to be your caster if you change it from in to out. But the little eccentrics and the shims and all are how you adjust those things on the ones that have those. I like the eccentrics better. All the way up until the early 2000s, though, Chevrolet on their S10 put those silly shims in there. But, I mean, some of the trucks that will have eccentrics, you know, the, the full-size pickups had eccentrics, and I like that better. Okay, look at this. Remember positive and negative caster. Don't get these confused, right? You got that? I did not even make that a really good thing because it, it says front, but there's no nothing pointing to anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Steering axis. That's smooth, isn't it? Brilliant. Outstanding performance. The direction of travel. Got it? If you've got the direction of travel is basically this one. Yeah. And negative caster is going to be like that. Positive caster is going to be like that. Got me? You understand that? Just remember, I should have put arrows on here and I dropped the ball. But anyway, if you're basically, if you're driving down the road, the farther forward you go with your caster, the more positive it is. 
You're also, if you go too far forward of it, you're going to feel road shock when you hit bumps and stuff. It's going to drive into the car and bam. If you go too far this way, it's squirrely. You see how that is? Imagine yourself, like I say, with one of these casters like you have on the bottom of a shopping cart or like you pull one out of a swivel chair, right? Okay, so you're holding that thing, and I'm going to show you pictures of that in a minute on here. If you hold that thing at an angle, I guess it's more stable, isn't it? The wheel mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, if you hold it at an angle and push it along. But if you just try to push it like this, it just tries to go every which way. See, and it's real similar. Uh, okay. All right, there's your positive <coughs> caster load projection. See your load projection there? All right, on that. You got that? Positive caster load projection. All right, keep that in your mind. You know, burn it in on that. <coughs> and there's your negative caster load projection. The bottom of that picture was kind of cut off, but there it is. There's your steering axis. The steering axis, remember, the steering axis is where your ball joints are. You got me? The steering axis is the line that's drawn through your ball joints. Right now we're looking at the side, looking at the tire from the side, and then we're going to look at, be looking at it from the front. And we're going to be talking about some non-adjustable angle stuff you can measure, but you cannot adjust, okay? All right, now right here, we've got, there's, look at this table with a positive cast room. You've got a forward load there. See that? See that load? Where the load is? <coughs> forward force, pushing that way. Now, I don't like the way that's drawn because it's sort of disingenuous. Because, I mean, that caster right there, I would have drawn that with a wheel the other way. <coughs> just for cause, you see. But look at where the load is. Let's back up for a second. See where the load is? Mm -hmm. See? See, that's the reason they're doing that. See the load? That's where the load is right there. And that's how it should be? Yeah. Right well, if you've got positive caster, your load's going to be in front. In oh. front of where the wheel hits the ground. That's the reason they do it that way. Gotcha. On that one right there, though, but I mean, I would have uh, drawn the axis a different way. This is, you know, and there's the negative caster with the load behind the wheel. See the reference, the the relationship between that. I don't always think about this when everybody else does, but the relationship between the load and the and the base of the wheel is basically what your caster is for. The this is, I can say, and you've heard this before. That's where the rubber meets the road, <laughs> literally. Okay, here your steering axis is. The car is going to, now remember this, the car is going to pull toward the side with the least positive caster. Well, like I said last week, if you've got positive camber that's still in the, but it's positive but it's in the green, and you've got negative caster but it's still in the green, it's going to pull in that direction if that's on the same wheel. Got me? Even though it's in the green, doesn't mean it won't pull. This is not what would happen in a situation like that. You do, you do your alignment, and you're, you're pulling to the right. And you, you swap your tires around, and you're still pulling to the right. Your tire pressure's are right and all that kind of thing. And you're confused because everything's in the green on your alignment machine. However, if you see that it's in the, if it's close to the edge of the positive, I mean of the uh, green toward the positive camber, and it's close to the green toward the negative caster, <coughs> and it's going to pull that way for that reason, you've got to get it better if there's any way you can. There's your steering axis at zero caster. See how that looks? Basically how you're working right there. All right. Look at positive caster. Now this is what happens when you turn the wheels and you have positive caster. You're basically going to pick the car up. Remember that? You, you pick the car up when you're all the way on one side. You pick it up on the other side and it wants to come back to the middle. That's why whenever you sort of let go of the wheel, it comes back to the middle and you're going straight down the road again. And if you got one that won't return, that's disgusting. You know, you turn and you're kind of expecting it to kind of want to go back to the middle. And if it don't, you know, you may be wondering about your caster angles. Or if you've got some really stiff steering part. Now, when I run into a situation like that where i got one that doesn't want to return to the center, I jack the car up and get the weight off of it, and I turn the wheels to see if they're real stiff. Sometimes the ball joints will get real stiff, and you got to replace them for that, for that reason. We've had to do that before. And they'll make a difference in the way it drives. However, if the ball joints aren't stiff <coughs> and they won't return, you better be looking for caster because the caster may be kind of neutral. See, because you actually are supposed to have it just naturally where it wants to go to the middle, which would be the lowest place. And that's one of the things caster does. Every time you make a caster adjustment, you have to go back and do another caster sweep. So you can see what you change. You can't, that's not a live adjustment. Camber is, toe is, caster is not a live adjustment. <coughs> it may, you can get an angle, a sort of a, you know, your numbers may change on the machine, but you're not going to know until you do another caster sweep. All right, your camber changes on turn. Now, how many of you guys have noticed and uh, you too, Abby, if you turn the wheel, that's whenever you see a car sitting there and somebody's parked it with the wheels turning, the wheel's leaning. You ever seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the reason for that. 
Think about it. If you're going around a curve, don't you want that wheel to kind of lean into the turn? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to make it better. And that's what your motorcycle does. When you're going around the turn, you're going to lean into it. And you're, it's good for the car to do that, too. It makes it more stable on turns. Wait a minute. I messed up. Okay. There's a, uh, see how the car, the wheels are scrubbing? When you're going into a turn, your car will bend up this way. And your tires are having to force something to happen that really doesn't want to. And so basically, they're you know, steering you kind of like the rudder on a boot. Okay, there's your uh, negative camber on one side, positive camber on the other. Load shifts from the center of the tire to the shoulder. You got that? See the load? The load's important uh, to the people that, you know, put this thing together. That's basically what you're looking at right there. Let me make sure I'm all caught up with the notes here. And we're still talking about adjustable angles, right? All right. <clears throat> there's toe in, there's toe out. Got it? You understand that? Looking at it from the top. You got me? Toe in, toe out. Burn it in. Hey, man, what's up with your bad self and everything? Okay. All right. Now, you can either you can either measure toe in inches or degrees. You notice the difference? Inches is basically the difference between the front and the back. Degrees is measured on a circle. Got me? You I mean you're basically you can you can pick it either way you want to. Now he was talking to, or uh, Willie was talking the other day, or was it you? He was talking about being able to do it without a machine, or was that you? Somebody was asking me about that. How can I do it without a front end machine? What do y'all that mean? All right. So if you got it without a front end machine, you can actually measure. I've known of people using a dead gum yardstick to set their toe, and you can use a carpenter's uh, square. I mean, not a square, but a carpenter's level to check your camber. <laughs> I mean, it's doable. Yeah. Now, the caster is something you cannot do without, you know, some special equipment. You know, so you're not going to be able to change caster. But most of the time, toe is what you're concerned with anyway, toe and camber, you know. All right. There's your zero toe. Right there. You got that? See zero toe? That looked at from the top. Mm -hmm. Not hard to understand. All right. The toe end, where? That's a bias belted tire. If it's towed in, you see how it's got this sawtooth? Bias belted is an ancient tire that we don't have no more. All right. All right. And you got a radial tire. Toe in wear on a radial tire is going to look like that. If you drag your fingers across one of those old bias ply tires, you'd get feel saw teeth. All right. And uh, you got this right here, the radial tire. You're basically going to see it scrubbing off the tread on one side, you know, but you're basically your camber can wear it out that way too. All right. So then you got, if you got zero toe would be the dotted line, you got toe out being what we got here. On a front wheel drive car, you know, basically got a little bit of toe out's going to pull in. Now, this is your toe out on turns. You're going to have to have this tire turn in a little sharper than that one when you're turning, and they've even got drawn that way, see, because of the fact that this tire is making a smaller circle. Another thing that has got to be factored in on the circle is the fact that this tire here has got to roll faster than that one when you're turning in that direction. You hear me? You got that? All right. Center line. There you go. You got to check the turning angle. The left front wheel. Now, that's pretty important. These angles are pretty important. There's your center line, turning angle for the right front wheel. You can actually measure that, but can you change toe out on turns? You cannot. It's just there. It's built into the steering geometry. You can't do it without making uh, changes. This is another non adjustable angle. Steering axis inclination. You are going to get a sheet here in a few days where you're going to have to draw. Steering axis inclination. Remember this, what it looks like. See the steering axis? The steering axis is that imaginary line coming through the ball joints, and this is your zero reference. You got me? Steering axis inclination is that angle right there. Are you, are you familiar with what I'm saying? You got that? That's your steering axis inclination. The inclination of the steering axis. And it's measured by the machine in degrees, and whenever you measure it, and you find out if it's not right, you can't change it. You can change the included angle, which actually is going to be, like let's say that you've got this vertical line, and you've got your steering axis, and then you've got positive camber. You know, the included angle is that one right there, which includes your camber, and that's an angle that's off the center as well. I'm going to give you guys a handout that's got a lot of notes and everything. that has all these same pictures on it. <coughs> all right. Now, this is, a, this is actually a... Uh, these illustrations were done by General Motors Corporation several many years ago. All right, so here you go. There's you got a scrub radius down here too. Now that's pretty interesting. 
The scrub radius is how much of the tire you want when you turn it, and that's going to be different based on your angles, you see. This is not anything you're really going to be concerned about a whole lot. I guess it's almost like learning about Ohm's law whenever you're uh, um, doing electricity. Yeah, doing electricity. But at the same time, if somebody has changed the wheels and the wheels are the tires are riding farther out, you know what I'm saying? Like they got deeper dish wheels, like these hot riders like to do. Mm -hmm. the, the scrub radius is going to be different. It's going to change the handling characteristics of the car. And so just keep that in mind. You know, it's, that also uh, a uh, non-adjustable angle. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, it, it is, but it isn't. I mean, if you, you can actually change the wheels and change it a little bit. All right, so here you got a, uh, but technically it's a non-adjustable angle. See where, the, see where this intersection is? Now, I need to back up. See where that, basically, the steering axis inclination, where it crosses the camber line, is going to affect your scrub stru stru your, uh, radius. You see that? See how if it's right here? The scrub radius is right there. Now, let me back up to that other one. You can compare that. See how this, that uh, line, when you draw that angle, if that line actually crosses down below the pavement, <laughs> and see the angles, you know, see the angle there and the angle there, if the line is below the pavement, your scrub radius is going to be different. All right, we're going back and forth. See that? See where the angle's moving? That makes sense? Now, this is two different kinds of suspension. I don't know why they did it that way, but, you know. Now, this right here, you got a shorter wheelbase on one side, and you do the other side. That's basically the setback. You got me on that? When you see setback, when somebody's talking about setback, you got it? Then you're gonna you need to know what <coughs> setback means. If you're familiar with that. Okay. How does that happen? Well, it's actually there's a little bit of a uh what am I trying to say? Occasionally it's because of an accident. Sometimes it's a little bit designed into it. Now this is huge the amount. They're just making it they're basically uh, making or magnifying this, but it can cause it to pull. So if it's correctly lined, but still got a handling problem on a steering wheel that goes off center of the car moving, it could be an extreme setback, and it could be manufacturing tolerance error. It could be because of an accident and forces the frame out of square into more of a diamond shape. See if the car gets T-boned or something, and then they go ahead and fix all of the body parts of it and everything, but everything else is kind of bent. <laughs> But you know, you line it up. You see where I'm going with that? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different factors that can go into it. And if you're looking, your machine out there is smart enough to where it's going to be able to measure that. It's, it can measure the setback on it, and it'll give you that information usually. All right, there's torque and memory steer. Uh, these, uh, This is front-wheel drive stuff. Uh, this is going to cause a front-wheel drive. How many of you have ever felt torque steer? When you take off on a really powerful front-wheel drive car and it tries to jerk the wheel out of your hands and go in one direction. You know, because of the difference in the length of the CV axles. You might even notice that on Abby's car, Ford built the uh, CV axles the same length. And they actually put the uh, a little bar out there when that reduces that torque steer stuff. But when they first started building them, they'd have a CV axle that was really long on one side and one that's short on the other side. And you really get on it, the short one wouldn't twist, the long one would, and it'd cause the short one to try to pass up the long one <laughs> just enough to where it would pull it over there. Memory steer is whenever you turn and you're trying to come back to the middle, and it tries to go back to where you were turning. You know, that's a crazy thing. And, um, and you know, there's just, that's big first and strut stuff going on there. But most of that stuff has been tuned out of these vehicles. You know, the, the wind up in the top of the McPherson and strut where the mountain assembly is located can cause it to do the memory steer. You know, that spring has got a bearing on the top of it so that it's carrying the weight of the car. And when you turn, it's supposed to go. And you may hear a car, sometimes somebody will be turning a wheel back and forth. <laughs> And you'll hear something, you know, pop it or carry it. I'll go like that. And if I'm hearing that racket up under there, I have them, you know, sitting still. I reach over the tire and put my hand on the spring. And I have them to turn the wheel. And if you hear that, uh, feel that spring, you know, loading and unloading, and you can feel it with your hand, you're going to replace that bearing on top of the strut. And they sell those. Not that hard. you got to pull the strut off, tear it down, put the bearing on there, and put it back together. Got it? Okay. There's your mountain assembly in the top nut. And there, right under there, there's a bearing. You know, it's not as simple as, you know, if you can actually, when you pull that strut apart, you can actually feel that bearing. And we've had to replace some of them here. All right. Now, and your front wheels are lined to the vehicle center line. We're getting close to the end. You know, this is really pretty close. Uh, the rear axle being out of square. We talked about that last time. And the front wheels compensating for the rear, rear axle steer problem. See that? And there's your alignment reference. There's your thrust line. See where that thrust line is? The axles, you know, pushing the, 
This right here, on the ones that don't have an adjustable rear end, it's got rear wheel drive, that's where it's pushing the car down the road. The old cars had what they call a torque tube, and it was 